We're glad you could join us for another episode of Optimal Anesthesia, where we explore the intricacies of medicine to shed light on pressing medical concerns. Our focus today is on Abdominal Compartment Syndrome ACS, a disorder that is frequently overlooked despite the grave danger it presents to severely sick patients. So, picture this, inside your abdomen, there's a delicate balance at play. It's like a symphony of organs working together, and the conductor is none other than abdominal compliance. Think of it as the elasticity of your abdominal wall and diaphragm, crucial for keeping everything in harmony. Now, in our story, there's a disruptor, a villain named intraabdominal hypertension, or IAH. It's the rise in pressure inside your belly, causing chaos in the orchestra. This pressure hike messes with blood vessels, affecting their tone and the connections between cells. It's a real-life domino effect. But that's not all, IAH also triggers the release of hormones that mess with your body's fluid balance, making things even more complicated. Now, here's where the plot thickens. In 2004, a group of medical superheroes, known as the World Society of Abdominal Compartment Syndrome, swooped in to bring order to the chaos. They set standards, created guidelines, all because Abdominal Compartment Syndrome ACS, was flying under the radar. ACS is the point where things get really serious, with intra-abdominal pressure surpassing 20 millimeters of mercury. And guess what? Failure to spot and tackle ACS in time is like missing a crucial plot twist, it's an independent predictor of mortality. But fear not, because there's hope. With clinical suspicion, monitored protocols, and swift action, we can turn the tables and save the day. It's all about identifying the problem early on and intervening before the real drama unfolds. But let's not get lost in the medical thriller. We've got grades to consider, not your classroom grades, but the World Society of Abdominal Compartment Syndrome's grading system for IAH. Grade I, like the calm before the storm, with IAP at 12 to 15 millimeters of mercury. Grade II, where things start to heat up, reaching 16 to 20 millimeters of mercury. Grade three, a definite storm warning, hitting 21 to 25 millimeters of mercury. And finally, grade 4, the hurricane level, with IAP soaring beyond 25 millimeters of mercury. Now, when we hit grades 3 and 4, with IAP exceeding 20 millimeters of mercury, it's like the red alert for ACS. Certain surgeries, like liver transplants or abdominal aneurysm repairs, become high-risk endeavors, adding more layers to our medical saga. ACS isn't just a one-size-fits-all villain, it has its origins. It could stem from primary causes like trauma or secondary factors like ascites or pregnancy. And here's a twist, chronic elevation of IAP isn't always triggered by high-intensity events. Conditions like obesity and cirrhosis can play the long game, gradually pushing up that baseline IAP. It's like the silent antagonist, slowly building tension. First up, we have diminished abdominal wall compliance. Picture this, your abdominal wall is like the body's natural fortress, and several factors can affect its compliance or flexibility. Things like abdominal surgery, adhesions from previous surgeries, major trauma, burns, mechanical ventilation, and even obesity can all play a role in tightening up this fortress. Now, let's shift our focus to increased intraluminal volume. Think of your abdominal space as a room, and anything that increases the volume inside can cause trouble. Gastroparesis, gastric distension, ileus, constipation, toxic megacolon, and issues like volvulus, they're like the unexpected guests that make your abdominal space feel a bit too cramped. Moving on, we encounter increased extraluminal abdominal volume. Imagine your abdominal region as a carefully organized space, and suddenly there's a clutter of things outside the designated areas. Hemoperitoneum, pneumoperitoneum, severe pancreatitis, 
liver failure with ascites, tumors, abscesses, it's like a chaotic house party, and your abdomen is the venue. And let's not forget the capillary leak slash fluid resuscitation aspect. Imagine your body's plumbing system experiencing a leak. This could be triggered by damage control surgery, bacteremia, systemic inflammation, coagulopathy, sepsis, or even going a bit overboard with fluid and blood product transfusions. It's like your body's internal pipes are dealing with unexpected waterworks. Now, I know we've thrown a lot of information at you, but understanding these factors helps us grasp the complexities of IAH and ACS. It's like unraveling a mystery within our own bodies, and every piece of the puzzle contributes to the bigger picture. Let's embark on this journey through the pathophysiology of ACS. Your body is like a bustling city, and the inferior vena cava is a major highway. In ACS, it's as if there's a traffic jam on this crucial route, causing lower extremity edema. Your heart, the central command, struggles as diminished venous return leads to decreased blood and oxygen delivery to the city's outskirts. It's like a concert with a weak sound system, not everyone gets to enjoy the show. And to add to the chaos, the diaphragm decides to throw a party, elevating the stakes by compressing the heart itself. It's a cardiovascular conundrum. Now, let's shift our focus to the respiratory realm. Think of your lungs as balloons. In ACS, it's like someone squeezing these balloons. Tidal volume shrinks, functional capacity deflates, and resistance skyrockets. It's a respiratory roller coaster. Imagine trying to breathe freely with someone pressing on your chest. Oxygen exchange becomes a struggle, like a DJ playing the wrong track at a party. Alveoli collapse, creating a dead space where the party falls flat, leading to a hypoxemic and hypercarbic dance floor. Our journey takes us to the renal realm, where the kidneys are the filtration plant of our city. But in ACS, it's like someone is building roadblocks, impeding blood flow and compromising filtration. The kidney workers are stressed, and the renal cortex faces a traffic diversion. The hormonal traffic controllers, like the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, go into overdrive, trying to manage the chaos. Oliguria and anuria become warning signs, it's the kidney's way of saying, Houston, we have a problem. Now, let's explore the abdominal arena. Imagine your abdomen as a bustling marketplace. In ACS, it's like a sudden construction project makes the pathways narrow. Blood flow decreases, and the marketplace suffers. Inflammatory sparks fly, aggravating the situation. It's as if the food stalls are closing down one by one. The risk of bacterial invasion is like an unwelcome guest, and the liver, our metabolic maestro, struggles to keep the show running. It's a symphony of chaos leading to metabolic acidosis. Finally, we arrive at the nervous network, the control center of our city. Elevated intra-abdominal pressure is like a dark cloud over this control center. Venous drainage from the brain faces obstacles, leading to increased intracranial pressure. It's like a storm brewing inside your head. The brain's traffic lights flicker, and the roads narrow. Elevated PACO2 adds fuel to the fire, making it a perfect storm. It's a delicate dance between pressure and flow in the intricate web of the nervous system. To kick things off, let's talk about imaging. While not the go-to for ACS diagnosis, it can be a crucial first step in spotting signs of intra-abdominal hypertension. Picture this, early indicators on imaging like a peritoneal to abdominal height ratio over 0.52 or a maximal anteroposterior to transverse abdominal diameter ratio over 0.8. It's like getting a sneak peek into what might be brewing inside. Now, 
onto the nitty-gritty, intra-abdominal pressure measurement. There are direct methods, like using pressure transducers during laparoscopic surgery, but they're a bit like diving headfirst into the deep end. Invasive, yet highly accurate. On the flip side, the indirect method is the golden child here. Picture this, a Foley catheter, a three-way stopcock, and 25 cubic centimeters of sterile saline injected into the bladder. It's like checking the pressure inside a balloon, normal is below 5 millimeters of mercury, but anything over 25 millimeters of mercury? Red flags waving high. And for those times when the bladder's playing hard to get, there are alternative screening methods. Central line placement to measure inferior vena cava pressure, a bit like checking the heartbeat of the abdomen or, the less common but intriguing manometry through a Jackson Pratt drain. It's like eavesdropping on the secrets of the abdomen through a special drain. But here's the kicker, if all else fails, be wary of potential inaccuracies. Pelvic fractures, bladder hematomas, and peritoneal adhesions can throw a wrench into the works. It's like trying to read a book with a few missing pages, you might get the gist, but the details matter. To sum it up, this step-by-step -step evaluation is like putting together a puzzle. From those early imaging hints to the gold standard of intra-abdominal pressure measurement, it's about connecting the dots to identify and intervene in cases of abdominal compartment syndrome. In the intricate world of abdominal compartment syndrome, ACS, management, precision is the key to success. Let's unravel this comprehensive strategy for tackling ACS with finesse. Firstly, non-surgical interventions play a crucial role. Imagine them as the initial superheroes, nasogastric and rectal tubes, endoscopic procedures, and drainage methods, all working to combat elevated intra-abdominal pressure. Sedation and smart dressings join the league, enhancing abdominal wall flexibility. The SAC steps in with recommendations, advocating for fluid optimization and considering advanced techniques like hemodialysis, though the evidence is a bit like deciphering ancient scrolls. Now, picture a sleek, minimally invasive hero, percutaneous catheter drainage. Perfect for ACS caused by unwanted abdominal guests, air, fluid, or blood, it's the covert agent, less invasive than its surgical counterpart and ready for action when immediate surgery isn't the superhero we need. But wait, when all seems lost, enter the grand surgical decompression. A last resort if non-surgical attempts fall short. Emergent laparotomy is like the superhero cavalry, swiftly relieving pressure and restoring order. The aftermath involves managing an open abdomen, like a shield against infections, insensible losses, and unwanted facial drama. Closure attempts follow, either with mesh or primary techniques, in subsequent evaluations a bit like the hero getting a well-deserved rest. Yet, every hero has its challenges. Complications lurk fistulas, protein losses, hernias, and infections. Some face a villain called recurrent ACS, showing up in up to 20% of cases, persistent and unyielding. Now, let's dive into the epic debate timing for surgical decompression. Despite a library of literature, the ideal moment remains a mystery. Is it an early entrance, risking stress, or a grand finale after exhausting conservative attempts? The debate continues. In conclusion, ACS management is a hero's journey, balancing non-surgical and surgical heroes based on the patient's unique storyline. Surgical decompression, while definitive, carries complications. The goal is clear, defeat elevated pressure, revive organs, and script the best possible outcome for our patient, the ultimate protagonist. So, what's the takeaway from this medical drama? time is everything. ACS isn't just a chapter in a medical textbook, it's a real-life thriller, where early intervention is the unsung hero. 
Stay with us on Optimal Anesthesia. Remember, in the ACS saga, every second counts. Stay curious.